Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have this event. Uh, we are thrilled to be uh, hosting this uh, first virtual workshop on Terra Incognita, diving into the subcortex with the IMCN laboratory of the University of Amsterdam and the Amsterdam Brain and Cognition uh, organization. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a few opening remarks and then I'll uh, go through a bit of a longer introduction on the, not just this session, but the, uh, the workshop in general and then we'll, uh, we'll start with our first session and our invited speakers. So why this workshop? Um, I first wanted to start with these beautiful illustrations from our, our neighbor from Abkhauder, Rudolf Neuenhaus, uh, showing the human brain in all its uh, beauty and glory. And already in that picture, you can see that there's a lot of numbers kind of in the middle, right? So this is really what we want to, to look at today and the next couple of days is what is going on in the subcortex? Why are we all looking at all these different things that seem to be very packed together, uh, especially as uh, nowadays and even in the past, and I will uh, describe a bit more in detail, We've been focused as neuroscientists a little bit more on the, the outer side, on the cortices of the human brain. So this workshop was only made possible thanks to the uh, incredible uh, kindness of 17 top scientists in the field who all accepted to join us uh, today, tomorrow and the day after uh, to have this very uh, exciting and lively meeting on a lot of different topics. Uh, they come from 15 different institutions, six countries, three continents, which also means five time zones, which is why we're having a little bit of a weird timing for all of the meeting happening right now. I was also extremely impressed by the uh, enthusiasm of the people who registered uh, I think we had more than a hundred uh, registration within the first day of uh, advertising the workshop. We have people from over 20 countries, more than 50 institutions, and we have a very nice mix of undergraduate, graduate students and postdocs, uh, professors, researchers, and uh, other uh, professions as well. The format of the workshop is organized over uh, five different thematic um, sessions, which are somewhat separate. You will also probably see that some of the speakers uh, will talk about things that are uh, possibly in two or three or four different sessions at the same time. But we try to, to organize that a little bit. Um, so first, we're going to talk about charting the terrain cognita, specifically looking at efforts towards atlasing and characterizing subcortical structure. Then later tonight, we're going to uh, talk about prob probing the deep brain, uh, so putting subcortical research particularly in clinical context. And I'm very happy that we also have in this session uh, four speakers uh, looking at uh, subcortical issues in very different ways and for different diseases as well. Tomorrow, we'll start with bridging MRI and microscopy, which uh, uh, I will argue in a moment is a, an essential step, uh, really, in order to look at the subcortex with the, the details that we need. Uh, and likewise, tracing the subcortex network is a major endeavor. Uh, here in particular, we also have a very diverse uh, set of speakers going from very precise tri track tracing all the way to uh, resting state connectivity uh, approaches. So I think it, it's going to be very exciting for that. 
uh, and then Wednesday we're gonna finish uh, with looking a little bit more at the behavior side of thing. So uncovering subcortical behavior, uh, looking particularly how, how to do that with uh, cognitive modeling and how we can then link cognitive modeling with more experimental neuroscience. Uh, finally, uh, we want to wrap the entire workshop on Wednesday evening with a general discussion session where everybody and people from different, uh, different sessions can uh, interact. For each of the sessions, the format will be the following. So we'll have a, an introduction by the moderator of about 15 minutes, except for this one, which will be half an hour. So whenever we have something that's set, we have to make exceptions. Um, then we will have invited presentation from each of the speakers. Uh, we ask them to prepare a talk for about 30 minutes so that we have then afterwards uh, 15 minutes left so we can do discussions, uh, questions, uh, talk a little bit about every, uh, a lot of different things, and then also take a few breaks if needed uh, for uh, stretching our legs, having a, a drink of water or another coffee. Um, <clears throat> given the fact that we have more than 100 people and uh, at least 300 registered, maybe not all at the same time. Uh, I will ask you to please ask all your questions using the chat window. We will monitor all of it. Uh, we'll try to ask as many questions as possible from the chat uh, to the speakers right away. And if you have leftovers uh, questions, we will then bring them back into the general discussion at the end of the workshop. Uh, we will try also really hard to keep each section, it's each section starting and stopping at the official time. All right. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to invite you all to come and visit uh, beautiful Amsterdam, uh, which is a pity, of course, uh, but we could at least bring you a little bit of, of Amsterdam flavor and that's uh, Something that I've learned when I first came to the Netherlands is an interesting word, which is uh, So we want to make this workshop a Geselligheid zone. Geselligheid uh, is about coziness, uh, if you look at the kind of literal translation. But it's, it's coziness in the wider sense. It's being comfortable, being relaxed, both physically, but also mentally and emotionally. Uh, so this depends, of course, on everybody's behaving properly and being respectful, patient, kind. Uh, sometimes things will not work with the internet or there will be some delays with uh, some of the uh, talks or sessions. Uh, just keep that in mind. We cannot do a lot uh, for that with the uh, uh, working from home situation we're in right now. Okay, and that was it for the uh, basic opening remarks. Uh, so welcome everybody. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the talks and all the process. And um, I will now move on to the uh, first introductory session on charting the terra incognita. Why such a challenging enterprise? So let me start with a quote from A.D. Johnsonberg from 2013. One curious feature of many cognitive neuroscience studies is that they focus only on regions of the cerebral cortex, ignoring subcortical or cerebellar structures. This appears to be an accident rather than a deliberate strategy. And indeed, if you look at um, most of the uh, human brain mapping literature uh, back from the earlier works of neuroanatomy, for instance, uh, Rodman and the Vogt and Vogt school, uh, all the way to the latest results in mapping cortical hierarchies, uh, 
you find a lot of cortical maps in the articles over and over again. And you can see that in the middle, we still have a very, very black region that just not covered in all these articles. So we, we want to change this state of affairs, of course, um, but maybe, maybe it's not necessarily a good idea. So maybe the first question to ask is, well, how much of the brain are we really missing here? So how many structures? Um, so in this uh, review uh, from uh, 2017, um, Beate Forsman and colleagues actually just numbered all the structures that were uh, found in the subcortex anatomically and came to the number of 455 for each side. Um, so it seems quite a large number. And it is indeed a large number if you compare it to the number of structures that people have assigned to the cerebral cortex. So from the early work of the Vogt and Vogt school up to the latest maps from uh, Matt Glasser and uh, David Van Essen, we're at a number of about 180 regions per hemisphere. So you can appreciate already how the subcortex is at least as complex in terms of, of subregions and regions and um, subdivisions as the um, cerebral cortex itself. And indeed, there has been already quite a lot of work um, mapping those regions, going from the um, larger ones in the early stages to smaller and smaller structures. And you can see in some of these very recent atlases, which I hope some of the speakers today and uh, tomorrow will we'll talk about a little. Uh, you can see that we're going to very, very small structures um, in quite impressive detail. One of the reasons for this is the advent of ultra high field MRI. So with uh, seven Tesla and above, we can really get to the level of uh, sub-millimeter um, voxel resolution in vivo. And, and we can start really pointing out and naming and, and even delineating more and more structures. A second advent that goes hand in hand with that higher resolution with the high field MRI is the um, the advent of quantitative MRI. So instead of taking a single T1 weighted image, which has uh, typically very poor contrast within the subcortex, you can now acquire in the similar amounts of time, quantitative maps of T1, T2 star, QSM, magnetization transfer, uh, parametric uh, information that are giving you a lot of different contrasts in the subcortex, uh, showing you iron, myelin concentration, and also some other details. But that's not even enough. Uh, we have uh, seen recently that uh, we can also put together uh, MRI and postmortem microscopy. And there's been recently some very impressive efforts in putting those things together. Um, one of the big challenge, of course, is to bring the uh, postmortem microscopy world, which is essentially in a slice by slice uh, system, into the 3D world of, of MRI. And there's uh, a few of the um, recent efforts there, and I, I believe we're going to hear about it uh, shortly um, as well. Another side of this that we will probably explore more tomorrow is that given the quantitative MRI in one hand and uh, microscopy details on the other hand, we can start bringing together some information about how the microstructure give rise to the MRI contrast and then 
inverting that modeling, being able to learn a bit more precisely what the contrast in the MRI tells us about the microstructural organization of the tissue. So all of this is quite exciting and it gives us a, a lot of detail on the anatomy. But then the second question is, well, now that we have all these different regions and we can actually see some of them or many of them, well, we should try to learn what they do. Um, and in this uh, recent meta-analysis, uh, my colleague Max Koiken uh, reviewed about 37,000 publications looking at subcortical structures in uh, fMRI studies and um, then tried to count a bit which one of them were more represented, uh, which one of them were more related to um, cognitive topics as opposed to uh, other uh, type of uh, activity and then trying to separate for each of those different structures, what kind of uh, um, psychological processes were uh, linked together. And what comes out of this study is that, well, so we have looked at least at 145 structure, which is a third of the 455 that we uh, counted before, which is quite impressive, but more than 50% of the studies are really focusing on the striatum, the thalamus, and the pons. Um, so it, it's very heavily based on those larger structures that have good um, contrast in uh, MRI and that are somewhat similar to cortex in a lot of their properties. Uh, the second uh, important point here is that even though we have association with psychological phenomena, we don't really have clusters that are coming along that some structures are more specific to different types of functions. So the stru structure function mapping, even for the structures that have been mapped uh, fairly uh, in detail, doesn't seem to be very, very clear. Um, it seems that there's a lot of overlap um, and not so much separation. And you can also appreciate that once you go beyond the first few uh, most uh, represented structures, there's just a lot of missing data where we don't know if there's any kind of structure function relationship. So maybe, maybe after all the subcortex is not that interesting if it's not involved in cognition, right? Well, let me take a, a bit of a tangent to a, a different field uh, to start answering this question and go to evolutionary genetics. Um, so in this study from a few years ago uh, that I found quite interesting, McCoy and colleagues uh, tried to look at which region of the human body were done regulating Neanderthal alleles the most. Uh, so by now, I hope you all know that we have Neanderthal genes as part of our genome, but thankfully our body tends to try to downregulate it so that it's not being ex expressed as much as our more modern human genome. Um, what was very interesting in that study is that you can see the region that have been ranked as being the most than regulated in blue are all brain regions and in yellow are the testes. Um, so it, it makes quite a lot of sense and it's interesting to see that. But what really got my attention was to look carefully at these different brain regions and the ones that come first that are most than regulated are codate, amygdala, cerebellum, spinal cord, putamen, nucleus accumbens, then comes the testes, then the hippocampus. And the cerebral cortex is actually a little further back. So it seems that there are some features of those uh, anatomical regions that is very important to keep as human as possible, uh, to stay um, human and not uh, Neanderthal. 
another piece of evidence that is much closer to our field and that, that we'll have uh, some of the speaker uh, discuss today and tomorrow uh, is the topic of deep brain stimulation. Um, so for movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, but also OCD, anorexia, depression, chronic pain, cluster ADH, epilepsy, so quite a variety of uh, brain disease and uh, neuropsychological disorders, we have the option to um, implant the deep electrodes into the subcortex and stimulate the brain that way to relieve some of the worst symptoms. And those uh, surgeries are done uh, routinely in a lot of countries and, and have gained quite a lot of uh, interest. Um, and this is quite uh, impressive because, well, deep brain stimulation, you go in the middle of the cortex, of the subcortex, and typically, for instance, for Parkinson's disease, you will target the subthalamic nucleus, STN, which is here, this little guy, and you can appreciate already from this uh, neuroanatomical maps that it's pretty crowded down there. So you have to be really precise where you, you go there. And not only that, but it seems that the subthalamic nucleus is also involved in multiple networks, motivation, cognitive, and motor networks that will have uh, different aspects. And so if you have um, tremors and, and movement disorders, Typically, you would like to be able to uh, affect the motor area without too much uh, influencing cognitive or uh, motor domains. Uh, and I'm very excited that for this uh, workshop, we will see some uh, presentation of some of the, the newest and uh, uh, most advanced work in the field with uh, adaptive brain stimulation and with uh, neurocomputational modeling of uh, how the electrodes uh, and the stimulation will then um, spread through uh, structural and functional networks and how we can use that then to uh, understand better the effects of the stimulation in different locations. And, and this question of um, the STN and the, the different networks is quite interesting and our group has been working on it for quite some time now because even though there are clearly some um, involvement of the STN into those three uh, systems and domains of cognition, uh, movement and motivation, it has been very elusive to, to find anything that would look like a clean separation between those different regions. Uh, so we could not really pinpoint a, an area either anatomically with that study where we looked uh, in microscopy across uh, 12 different uh, stains to look at patterns and we would see patterns, but they are not, they're not overlapping in the way you would expect from uh, regional differences. Or functionally with uh, MRI uh, study, F fMRI studies that are specifically targeting those um, uh, networks differentially from each other. Uh, we, we just could see uh, activation in the subthalamic nucleus, but not really pick out any significant differences. And it's also interesting because there are a lot of subcortical models of cognitions uh, on top of this. Uh, so here I have uh, purposely taken some slightly old uh, models uh, that were uh, created by some of our speakers who will uh, talk on Wednesday, and I'm hoping that they will share with us some of the uh, updated version of, of this. But you can appreciate that any kind of model of, of cognitive function that we are creating uh, tend to have cortex and subcortical structures 
really tightly uh, inter interconnected into a loop. And if you look at it also from a more neuroanatomical side, you also have the same complex subcortical uh, con connectivity systems uh, as uh, beautifully uh, presented, uh, for instance, by Susanna Baer and colleagues, how the striatum and the prefrontal cortex not only connect to each other, but work in loops that are um, mirroring each other and, and going into uh, some sort of a gradient at the same time. Um, and all the way to the recent works from uh, courageous Melbourne speakers who will talk very, very early for their time uh, to present their results on looking at the functional connectivity of um, the uh, striatum and um, thalamus. Um, also, these approaches have allowed us to also compare a bit more systematically what we can get, for instance, from track tracing and uh, from diffusion fMRI. So further um, validating or invalidating diffusion MRI's capabilities. And then we can use these networks uh, both structural and functional in um, disease case to uh, compare between different um, different patient groups and possibly even look at individual clinical outcome uh, changes uh, in, in deep brain stimulation. So I think I convinced you, well, I hope I convinced you by now that uh, there is a lot of things happening in the subcortex that it is really intrinsic to uh, brain function and cognition. But so why is it so elusive? Why don't we find that with fMRI? Well, there's, there's three main reasons, uh, location, biophysics, and size. Location, well, because the subcortex is in the middle, it is far away from sensors. Uh, whether you are looking at EEG and MEG, uh, FNES, which are recording from the skull, or even fMRI, which records volumetrically, but with coil elements that are closer to the cortex and have better SNR profile there. In fMRI, it's even uh, more pronounced if you look at um, acceleration techniques that will allow you to compress the signal in a way to increase temporal SNR, uh, but it will do that very well in the cortex and quite poorly in the subcortex, and the contrast then will increase. Um, one of the problems of being in the middle of the brain is that you're closer to the, um, the arterial uh, incoming uh, systems, so you have a lot of vascular signal contamination, you have physiological motion from breathing and respiring and, um, and heartbeat, uh, so there's a lot of extra motion and extra uh, artifacts to work with. In terms of the physics, there's also an interesting problem here that has been often overlooked, is that um, the bold signal that we see in fMRI is linked to T2 star signal. And the T2 star signal will change in different regions of the brain, and specifically in some of the subcortical regions we're interested in, like the STN, the substantia nigra, red nucleus, or globus pallidus. These regions have a very strong uh, iron concentration which means that their T2 star um, decay will be much faster than that of the cortex. And by the time you're at the right location to measure uh, cortical bold effects, you have almost no signal left for those subcortical regions. And so you systematically just throw them with the noise. 
And lastly, uh, I mentioned already how the subcortex is a very, very packed region with everything kind of tightly together. Uh, but you also have to, to, to compare that to the size of what we do classically in fMRI. So at a, a three Tesla a fMRI study will typically have a three by three by three millimeter voxel, which is pretty much the size of half or a third of a STN, uh, which can be quite, quite problematic. And of course, the other structures that we're looking at are not nice squares. So uh, there will be a lot of partial volumeing happening um, with neighboring structures. Uh, worse, in fMRI, we like to smooth things to have better SNR, and that will increase the partial volumeing and, uh, and reduce the, the specificity of the signal. And last but not least, we have uh, approaches that are based on removing what is likely to be noise, for instance, small clusters, uh, assuming that larger regions should be uh, involved in cognition. In the subcortex, if you have those small nuclei, it is not the case anymore. And so those uh, classical um, assumptions of analysis uh, make things worse. So with that, I, I hope you see that there is a need indeed to, uh, to, to work together to, to understand the subcortex better. And I think we already started this uh, process uh, with, uh, as a community. One step uh, that is now becoming a uh, standard is to share our subcortical atlases. I would like to thank at least uh, the lead DBS uh, website for taking the, the time and effort to look for all these new atlases coming out and listing them very accurately. Um, it is definitely a great resource. Uh, but in our lab, we also think we can go a little further than that. We can even share our own data sets. Uh, because as you see, and if we're looking at seven Tesla MRI, fMRI with high resolution, with quantitative MRI, maybe going to mixing it with post-mortem microscopy. So that a set are very difficult to obtain with a lot of effort and not everyone can, can really generate those. And so if we really want to study the subcortex as a group, well, we, we need to start sharing that data so that we can divide the task and have, have more results coming out the same way that um, a lot of beautiful cortical work has been uh, happening recently with initiatives like the um, uh, Human Connectome Project of the UK Biobank. Uh, lastly, uh, it's also important to share our tools and models uh, especially as if we're looking at really high resolution MRI with new contrast or microscopy put in 3D, we don't necessarily have those tools ready at hand. And it's, it's important to try to make those available as much as possible. And so for this workshop, I hope we're gonna do a, a one of the first steps, which is to share the science uh, so I have a bit of an overview of the state of the art, uh, looking maybe to try to identify what are the uh, outstanding questions that we, we need to address as much as possible. Uh, we can appreciate what are the, the best atlases that have been coming out very recently, uh, what up, upcoming techniques or developing techniques we should be paying more attention to. Uh, what protocols we should use for MRI, fMRI, and analysis, um, which models we can use also to strengthen our uh, uh, experimental work by building strong hypotheses, um, and uh, what, what data sets we can already use or hopefully share in the, the next future, and, and the finding ways to combine those uh, data set in ways that are uh, useful for everybody. And in particular, for trying to bring all that information to help for clinical translation. So this is my hope for this um, 
workshop. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, the first session, chatting the Terra Incognita, with uh, Juan Eugenio Iglesias from University College London and the Mass you know, Center of, for Biomedical Imaging in Boston, followed by Mala Chakravarti from McGill University and Jonathan Lowe from Emory University will give us uh, quite a few uh, interesting views on atlasing, uh, in particular using histology and MRI together, um, looking also at uh, things like genetics and uh, going into some small regions like the zona inserta. Um, I see that we have about three minutes left for the uh, on the time. Uh, so I would invite everybody to take a two to three minute break and then we will reconvene at uh, 3.45. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> 